Section Algebra 1, Lesson 94. Today we're going to go back to those distance equals rate times time problems that we've been talking about. And we're going to look at a second type. Before we do that, I'm going to review the type 1 for you because who remembers every little detail? Okay, the type 1... I call Lord of the Rings. You will not see this reference in John's pages. In this style of problem, we have Sam and Frodo taking the ring to Mordor and then going back to the Shire. Their trip is exactly the same length, going to or fro. You can also look at their trip, say like this. They leave Sam, no, let's do Frodo first. Frodo leaves the Shire <clears throat> and goes to Mordor. Sam goes with him every inch of the way. <clears throat> they make the same trip. In both of these scenarios, what you'll notice is that the first distance equals the second distance. And so we can write a simple little equation that looks like this, d1 equals d2. And then we can remember that Distance also equals rate times time, so we can change each of these distances to be rate one times time one equals rate two times time two. This is what we call our base equation because John is gonna give us information about the rates and the times, so we'll plug it into this. We use the pictures to help us draw what's happening in the problem. Then we write a distance equation based on the picture. Then we take this and blow it up into rates and times. So once you have read the problem, you go to the picture, to the distance equation, and then to the detailed equation. Then you go back to the problem and get the details. This is the Lord of the Rings style. Today we're doing a different kind. There are three, there are four types in all. We're gonna do three this year and then next year we'll review these three and then learn a fourth. Type two, this is based on the Titanic. Now you may not have seen the movie, the Titanic, but you know the story. Large ocean liner leaves England on its maiden voyage to New York City. It's the largest ship ever built. It's considered unsinkable. It rams into an iceberg in the North Atlantic, way up in Canada. Actually, it doesn't run straight into the iceberg, and that's part of the problem if... Okay, so here's Canada and North America, and here's England over here. And so this is the open water. And here's the iceberg. The ship did not ram into it. That would have been fine because the bottom of the ship was divided up into compartments. So the first compartment, with the, the most forward compartment, would have been damaged, but the rest of them would have been fine. And it was designed to work that way so that if one of the compartments filled with water, the ship could still float because it couldn't spread to the rest of the ship. But what happened was the ship glanced off the side of the iceberg. More of a tangent, right? That's what we call that a tangent in math. And what it did was it ripped a hole along the side of the ship, right? As it went past, it continued to rip. And that put holes in many different compartments. And that's why the ship sank. Okay, so there's your, there's your very scientific diagram of what happened to the Titanic. So the Titanic is sinking. Lots of people died. They didn't have enough lifeboats for everyone. Oops, that was a problem. Uh, women and children first. Yes, they did that, but rich people also jumped in. And in the movie, there are two fictional characters named Jack and Rose. Rose is a rich lady and Jack is a poor man, but they're both on the Titanic. They fall in love, and when the ship goes down, they find themselves floating. 
in the ocean on a piece of debris. I'm gonna make it look like a raft, but it really wasn't. That's kind of a raft, pretend. Um, Rose was up on the raft crying her heart out. Jack was in the water and here he is, he's in the water. <laughs> he was holding on to the edge of the raft for a time and then he got hypothermia and he died and he sank to the bottom of the ocean. And Rose was fine. She was picked up by the other ship and continued on and went to New York City and lived her life. So they had this terrible part of the ways. All right, so what does that have anything to do with math? Well, let me show you. The first type two problem shows the ship merrily streaming along from England and the iceberg coming out of the north and they went bump in the night, didn't they? They banged into each other. So this is one of the distances and this is the other distance. And they add up to a total distance of K. Oh, this is something different. We haven't seen this before. But this is the total trip. So I'm just gonna write that here so we have it written down. Uh, now the other variation on this has to do with our friends Jack and Rose on the little raft. They were together. Then Jack went to the bottom of the ocean. Oops, technically we should try him going down, right? But I'm gonna draw him to the side. But Rose went on to New York and lived her life. So this is two other ways we can measure uh, in this type of problem, two things that start out together and go their separate ways. Or it can be two things that start from different places and meet in the middle. There's also a third variation that looks like this. And for this one, we can say Rose crossed part of the Atlantic on the Titanic and then she switched to another ship and she finished her total trip to New York City on that other trip. So there's three forms. Um, and there might even be more. It's easy to make subtle changes in these. But in all of these, you will see that the first distance plus the second distance equals the total trip. Last time, the two distances were equal, right, in these pictures. This is something altogether different. This is two smaller trips equaling one big one. No matter which of these pictures fits your scenario, this is the distance equation. And then again, we'll use rate times time to say R1T1 plus R2T2 equals K. And then this is what we'll use to do the problems. All right, so that's an introduction to the new type of dirt problem, if you will. Uh, let's try one. I have one more thing I want to tell you about, but let's, I want to tell you that in terms of the problem. We know enough to be dangerous now. All right, 94.1. Let's find out how many there are. Three. Um, remember that John calls these uniform motion problems because we're assuming... and it's a really big assumption that the people traveling travel at the exact same rate throughout their trip. Well, that's not true. We know that's not true, but we're pretending. Okay, example 94.1. I'm gonna read this to you the first time and I'm gonna ignore the numbers. I'm gonna kind of skip over those. We're just trying to figure out what's happening in this problem so we can make a picture of it. A southbound bus leaves Fort Walton Beach at 9 a.m. Two hours later, a northbound bus left the same station. Okay, so we have two buses that are starting out at the same station and going in opposite directions. So it's like this, right? And if we want, if you want, you can add details. This one left Oh, Fort Walton Beach is in the middle. Okay, 
So we know that this is the picture. One of the buses will have traveled that much. Um, let's call this S for the southbound bus. And let's call this for the northbound bus. You can use one and two, but it's nice to put a little letter in there that matches the story because that helps you keep the detail straight. So now I don't have to look at the book anymore. I can say, okay, the distance of the southbound bus plus the distance of the northbound bus equals K. And I can write in that K to the picture. We don't know how much that is yet because we haven't looked at any numbers. We're just using the basic strategy for attacking these problems to write all this down, right? And then I can also do this. The rate of the southbound times the time of the southbound plus the rate of the northbound times the time of the northbound equals the total distance that they will be apart at the end, the total trip. This is my distance formula. Now I can make a list. down the side. All of this I did without looking at the problem. Once you know how your story is happening, you can draw the picture and then all of this comes from there. Now we're ready to look back at the problem and get some numbers going here. A southbound bus left Fort Walton Beach at 9 a.m. Wait a minute. We want to know how many hours the trip took. We don't want to know what time it was on the clock. That is the third thing I need to tell you about before we can do these problems. Let's go get the other numbers and then we'll come back and talk about the time. Two hours later, okay, we'll deal with that later. Times we're gonna deal with later. The buses traveled at the same rate. Okay, that means we can take the subscript off. All right, remember that whenever we hear same rate or same time, we can take the subscripts off and just use a plain R with no subscript. Or we can use T the same way. All right, what that does is it changes what were two separate variables into one. We like it. <clears throat> the buses traveled at the same rate and were 352 kilometers apart at 2 p.m. Okay, that means the total trip was 352 kilometers. Now, let's figure out what to do with these clock times. When we have clock times given to us, then we have to make a special chart. And this is how it looks. Two rows, three, four columns, technically, right? Technically three rows, sorry. Three rows, four columns. This is our start time. This is our ending time, and this will be the number of hours that passed. I'll show you how to calculate all this. This is the southbound bus, and this is the northbound bus. Once you get the hang of these, you don't have to write the words in. You can just use abbreviations. It'll go a little faster. All right, so what we're going to do is go back to the problem and look at what we were told about the starting and ending times. The, north, the southbound bus started at 9 a.m., Two hours later, the northbound bus left. Okay, so two hours after 9 a.m. is 11 a.m. Um, if the buses traveled at the same rate and were 352 kilometers apart at 2 p.m., so 2 p.m. is the ending time. All right. So now we've got all of this information filled in. Now we need to calculate how many hours that is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay, this is how I do it. I calculate from the morning time till noon. So that would be three hours, right? Nine, it would be 10, 11, 12. And then two more hours, one and two, that is 
five hours. That is the number that goes up here. Now we calculate the northbound bus. 11 a.m., it's only one more hour to noon, plus two more. That means this bus traveled for three hours. Now we've got our times. The clock times have to be converted to the number of hours that actually passed in order to go into the formula. This little chart helps you do it. John does not use this little chart. He expects you to just figure this out in your head, which you can do, right? You can do that. But the problem is that with all the numbers that are flying around your brain, it often becomes overwhelming to students to try to keep them all organized. So this is a way to organize this information so that it's all straight in front of you. Okay, ready? We are now set. We've got everything here. And we're ready to plug in. So I'm gonna set this up with buckets. And I'm gonna fill in. Again, if you put these in the same order as this, it makes filling in really easily. R, five, R, three, three, 52. Oh gosh, that's cute, right? To write this like we normally see it, it's 5R plus 3R equals 352, right? The buckets are important for when you're starting, but you can quickly get rid of them and simplify. 8R, add like terms, equals 352. Divide both sides by 8, and we get... Um, I'll do the math down here. 8 into 35 goes 4 times. That's 32. We get another 32. And we see it comes out even at 44. So we say that R equals 44. We can write it as kilometers per hour, or some people like to write it as kilometers per hour like that. They like to write it as a fraction. Either way, this is the right answer. All right. One of the tricky things about these distance problems is because we have five different variables, John can really mix up uh, what he tells us and what he wants us to find out. There's a lot of variety in how we solve these problems, but the way we set them up is always exactly the same. All right, so now you know how to do a clock chart. We're going to have to do those in these other problems as well, and I'll show you how to shortcut this a little bit so that you don't um, waste your life on clock charts. 94.2. And by the way, John can also use this clock time trick back in those type one problems. Um, he didn't put us through that. He didn't put us through the clock time drama for those type one problems just because they were so new to us. Now he thinks that we've got it all figured out and so he's gonna be, I don't wanna say mean, he's gonna challenge us. Okay, here comes another one. And this one, that last problem, 94.1 about the buses, and this one about the trains, these are classic algebra problems that if, if you talk to someone who hasn't had algebra in a long time and hasn't thought about algebra in a long time and ask them what they remember about it, bus and train problems like this might be near the top of their list. A train starts from Toledo at 11 a.m. clock times and heads towards Mackinac, 332 kilometers away. At the same time, a train leaves Mackinac and heads for Toledo. Okay, if the trains meet at 1 p.m., what's the rate of the first train? Ah, stay right there. I'm getting something. Um, I have a visual aid for this problem. I'm from Michigan. A lot of my relatives still live there. This is my niece's save the date magnet. She's getting married this summer and their save the date 
magnet, so I don't forget when their wedding is, is a little map of Michigan. The nice thing about Michigan too is that it is the shape of a mitten, right? So I'm gonna do this so you can see it better. Um, Mackinac is right up here at the very tip of Michigan, and Toledo is down here. Toledo's actually in Ohio, um, but it's right at the border of Michigan. And interesting story, you know, when the territories, back in the day before they were states, when they were trying to become states, they had to have a certain population in order to uh, be granted statehood. And Michigan and Ohio, which is right down here, Ohio's right here, um, they were, oh, I have an even better visual aid for you. Wait right there. Even better, and I can use my white paper. They look kind of like this. They're not perfectly to scale. Toledo is right, a city right where the two touch. And so what was happening was that Michigan was just the mitten part, and both states, both potential states, needed the city of Toledo to get their population numbers up to the minimum, right? So they were fighting over who got to have Toledo because neither one of them could become a state without the city of Toledo. So they needed a compromise, and this is what was decided. Toledo would go to Ohio, and Michigan would get the Upper Peninsula. They would get this other separate chunk of land that had as many people in it as there were in the city of Toledo. So that way, both Ohio and Michigan could become states at the same time. Yay! My husband's from Ohio. I'm from Michigan. So, Ohio, we're done talking about you. They're going from, well, I'll put you back because Toledo's technically, they overlap just a little. So Toledo's right here, and Mackinac is the city right up here at the top. There's a bridge called the Mackinac Bridge that connects the two peninsulas of Michigan. It's a really cool bridge. There are great lakes on either side, and so it's a very impressive span. It's high, and in the winter, it is so icy and scary and dangerous to cross that bridge, but it's really, really fun. Okay, so that's what the trains are doing, is they're going up and down the length of the mitten. Yay. Okay, so our picture looks like this. They're starting at opposite ends, right? One is starting from Toledo and going north, and the other one is coming down from Mackinac, and they're going to meet in the middle, all right? So this is the distance starting in Toledo, and this is the distance starting at Mackinac. That's how we know what the picture is. Now we can go and fill in the information, the distance of the train from Toledo plus the distance of the train from Mackinac equals the total trip. Sometimes I write K right there too to remind me of that. And now we're gonna change it into rate times time RTTT plus RMTM equals K. And now I'm going to write my list down here. Now I'm all organized and I'm ready to go back and look at that problem again and get some numbers from it. The train starts from Toledo at 11 a.m. Okay, well, fine. I need clock time as well. I don't make the clock time chart to start. I wait and let the problem tell me if I need it. Okay, so now that we've done this once, I'm gonna show you my shortcuts. We need the starting time, I write an S. We need the ending time, I write an E and then H for the number of hours. This is the train from Toledo, and this is the train from Mackinac. All right, so just use abbreviations. You don't need to write it all out. The starting time for the train from Toledo is 11 a.m. It heads for Mackinac 332 kilometers away. So that I know is the total distance. At the same time, <clears throat> okay, so also at 11 a.m., <clears throat> the train leaves Mackinac and heads for Toledo 
at 65 kilometers per hour. Okay, so the rate of the train from Mackinac is 65. If the trains meet at 1 p.m., what is the rate of the first train? Okay, so that's what we're trying to figure out. Now we can figure out these hours. They start at 11 and they end at 1. That is just two hours, right? One hour to noon and then one more. So they each traveled for two hours. Beautiful. Okay, so now we're ready to plug in, right? So I'm going to copy this with buckets. And I'm going to fill in. I don't have anything for RT, so I just write RT. Two. Okay, now I simplify as I go. I'm gonna change the order of that. I don't like to have the letter first, I like the number first. Plus, okay, I'm gonna multiply this, that's 130 equals 332. Now I'll subtract the 130. Basic algebra. Goodbye. So the rate of the train from Toledo was 101 kilometers per hour. I'm gonna write it this way rather than as a fraction. This looks a little neater and simpler to me. Yay, that's the right answer. It's kind of cool to think that we can <clears throat> actually answer these questions because sometimes when I first see them, I think, what are you talking about? But it seems almost impossible that we could answer the questions, but we can. Okay, one more. We had a problem about buses, we had a problem about trains, and now we're going to look at ships. The ships were 400 miles apart at midnight and were heading directly toward each other. If they collided, oh my gosh, at 8 a.m., find the speed of both ships, blah, 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 blah. We don't need all of that. Okay, so they were a distance apart and then they crashed in the middle. Just like the Titanic and that iceberg, right? Now, these pictures are just approximations. I don't know if they met more or less in the middle. Maybe one ship was going super fast and the other super slow and it was way over here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're just drawing a picture that shows us the general pattern of how things are moving. All right, so I'm gonna call them, uh, I'm gonna call them ship one and ship two. So this is the first distance and this is the second distance. This is the distance of ship one and this is the distance of ship two. Now, and this is the total they traveled, I can write my formula as a distance formula and now I'll change it into rate times time. That's my base equation. So I'm gonna use these variables to make the list. I don't draw the clock chart right away because I don't know if I'm gonna need it. Sometimes John will still give us the hours in the problem. Sometimes he'll use this clock trick. <clears throat> Again, that's what you're looking for. If he's telling you the time on a clock, you know you need the chart. If he's saying just the number of hours that took place, then you don't need the chart. So I don't write it out unless I'm sure I need it. The ships were 400 miles apart at midnight. Okay, the miles apart is the K. Midnight is a clock time. So, all right, fine, John, have it your way. All right. 
This is my starting time. This is my ending time. And then this is the number of hours that have passed. This is ship one and ship two. Okay? Abbreviate. Make it simple. Um, they were heading toward each other. So this is at midnight. Now, midnight is neither a.m. nor p.m. So I write 12 o'clock midnight. In our culture, somehow we've gotten the mistaken mathematical opinion that midnight is p.m. and noon is a.m. It doesn't make any sense because midnight and noon are neither a.m. nor p.m. Okay, they're just midnight and noon. The a.m. means, it's, it's in Italian, I think, it's not English, but it's after midnight or, no, that's not what it stands for. But a.m. and p.m. do not belong as descriptions of midnight or noon. So I put M for midnight. Our society does it all the time, but mathematically it's wrong. They collided at 8 a.m. How many hours passed between midnight and eight in the morning? That's eight hours. And it's the same for both of them. Again, you can do these calculations in your head, but it's just one more thing that you have to keep track of and it gets really tricky. So the times are eight. The more we can organize our thoughts on paper, the more likely we are to get the right answer. Um, find the speed of both ships if one was 20 miles per hour faster than the other. Okay, so this means we have to write a, uh, an inequality and then we have to write a balancing statement. So let's say that this one is, R1 is faster than R2 and we know it's 20 miles an hour faster so we have to add 20 to the smaller side to get it to balance again. So we're gonna say R1 is the faster of the two. All right, we're ready for some buckets, aren't we? R1, we're gonna use R2 plus 20. Eight, don't have anything for R2. And I can see, oh look, they're the same. That looks good. Eight here, and then 400. All right, I'm going to rewrite this now, clean it up. I'm gonna distribute as I do that. This eight against the R2 plus 20. So it's gonna be eight times R2 plus 160 plus another eight times R2 equals 400. Okay, so I distributed <clears throat> as part of that process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, let's see. I'm going to add these like terms at the same time that I subtract the 160. And I get 16 R2 equals, let's see, what is this going to be? It's going to be 240. I'll divide both sides by 16. And I know 16 is gonna go evenly into this, but let's figure out how many times. 16 into 240, it goes in here once. 80, and then, okay, here's how my brain sees this. I hope this makes sense to you. 16 into 80, how many times? Well, if this was eight, 8 into 80 goes 10 times. But this is twice as big, so it's not going to go in as many times. It's only going to go in 5 times instead. Okay? The other way to think about it is 16 times 10 would be 160. 80 is half of 160, so this must be 5. I don't know if that's helpful or not. It wouldn't help me to have somebody say all that out loud. But we can see the relationship between 16 and 80 because 8 goes into both of them. All right, that's our answer because this is 80. So we're done. And so we say the rate of the second ship equals 15.
uh, is it kph or miles per hour? It's miles. And now I look and see, I should have been talking about this. You always want to check back with a word problem and make sure you've answered the problem as it was asked. Spot, find the speed of both ships. Excuse me, I'm super yawny today. We take the second ship and we add 20, so this would be 35. I didn't mention that earlier in this lesson, and that is my bad. Whenever we're doing word problems, look to make sure you've answered the question. It's super easy to write a sneaky question where you solve, but then you have to take that information and do something else with it. That's a very common trick that math textbook writers like to come up with. So make sure you always go back and look at the question and see that you got it right. Hey, guess what? We're done, finally. Lesson 94 is complete. That was kind of a long one. Um, it was kind of a hard one, but we're done. Yay, thank you, bye.